Pat. Hey, and welcome to your latest excursion inside my head, where today I wanted to share with you a few thoughts around concussion. So those of you who saw episode two of this uh, four-minute mile series would know that I've already spoken about concussion and head injury. That was in the context of law change in the sport of rugby union and trying to protect the head of the players and how it needs a cultural shift if that's going to happen effectively. And when I presented on that, I showed this graph, uh, which shows the increasing incidence of concussion year on year in English professional rugby. Now, at the time I was presenting it, I knew that there was quite a lot of nuance and context that needed to go into explaining what these numbers meant and how it's not necessarily all bad. And some of you actually even asked me on Twitter, to your credit. But because I didn't have time, I parked that subject in order to come back to it later. And then what happened was last night in the first round of the NFL playoffs, there was an incident involving Cam Newton where he is seen to collapse as he's walking off the field after a blow to the head. Apparently, he goes off and is diagnosed as not being concussed and continues to play. And all the reports have spoken about how he's been let down by the concussion protocol. So it seemed like a relevant time and an opportunity to talk about concussion again and a little bit around how it gets diagnosed or identified and where we go in the future. And so I wanted to bring that up again, starting with the same graph that I presented to you previously. So here's that graph, and what it shows you is the incidence of concussion uh, per thousand hours in each of the seasons from 2002 to uh, 2003, all the way up to 2015-16. And just to give you some context into what this means, uh, incidence is the number of concussions that happen per thousand hours. And in a match, you obviously have 30 players playing for 80 minutes, and so a single match makes up 40 hours of match play. And that allows us to convert this incidence number on the y-axis to something a little bit more palatable. So for instance, if we go all the way back to 2003-04, where the concussion incidence was its lowest at about three and a half per thousand hours, you can work out that that's one concussion every seven matches. In contrast, if we come up here to the latest season for which there is data, 2015-16, we see 16 concussions per thousand hours, which is one every one and a half matches. And so that means that over the period of 12 years here, we've seen just over a four and a half fold increase in the documented number of concussions. So I emphasize the word documented for a very specific and important reason. And it's that when you look at this four and a half fold increase in the concussion incidence over time, you're not necessarily looking at a real increase in how many concussions happened. It's not necessarily that the risk of concussion has gone up in the sport. It could be that the number of concussions has actually stayed relatively stable, but the difference now is that we are far more able to identify and diagnose those concussions than we were in the past. Now, if that's the case, then those very low numbers that you saw in 2003, 4, 5, actually tell you more about our inability to diagnose concussions back then than they tell you about the true risk of concussion being quite low. And the implication of that, ironically enough, is that this 450% increase in concussion is actually something that we could celebrate because it means that for the first time we are getting a proper understanding of the magnitude of the concussion issue in the sport and that will allow us to intervene in the future. Now, there are a couple of numbers that I want to give you that I, I hope you will see support that possibility. The first of those is 64 seconds. That is the average amount of time that a doctor has when he runs onto the field to assess an injured player to assess the player and then make a diagnosis that will either keep the player on the field or pull them off to be permanently substituted. Then the second number is 56%. That is the proportion of concussed players who kept playing on in that match at the 2011 Rugby World Cup. In other words, 56% of players who experienced a head injury kept playing that same game until the full-time whistle and only then were they diagnosed as being concussed by the team doctor. Now that's obviously not a good situation because now you've got this guy running out there, he's concussed, he's more likely to sustain another injury and in particular there's something called second impact syndrome which can be catastrophic and fatal. So this was a problem that had to be addressed. And I hope that all of you at home have managed to join the dots between those two numbers 
A big part of the reason for 56% of players continuing to play is the 64 seconds. It's simply too short for a team doctor to run onto the field and with that noise and intensity and energy to make a good diagnosis in only one minute and four seconds. So the solution to that was two things. Number one, you have to buy time. You have to create time for that medical doctor to escape the pressure of the sideline or the field and take the player away from it and do a proper diagnosis in more than one minute. And number two is you have to drive education, knowledge and awareness. And those two things, and I'm not sitting here telling you that rugby's figured this out because the system is not perfect and it needs to be improved. But those two things were the focal point of the policy changes made in 2012. One of those was to introduce a temporary substitution which would allow the injured player to come off and another one to go on in his place so that that injured player could then go away with the doctor and have a 10-minute assessment. So now we had 10 minutes for the doctor to spend with the player to try and do a better job of diagnosing whether they were concussed or not. And then secondly, the signs and the symptoms of concussion were formalized. So the sport came up with a list of 11 criteria which now exist. And if an athlete or a player is seen to show any one of these 11, then they have to be immediately and permanently removed from the field of play. So it was the formalization of knowledge into a policy allied to a growing awareness around concussion and what it looked like and why it was so serious that drove that 450% increase. And again, the point I want to make is that when we see that increase, it's not necessarily a sign that the sport is becoming more dangerous, but just that we are becoming better at understanding the risks. And I guess the final point I'll make is that in the NFL, uh, or any sport for that matter, football's the same, cricket's the same as well, is that if you don't create time and knowledge and awareness, then you're always going to get situations where players are concussed and keep playing. And again, rugby has not eradicated that problem. We've gotten better. That 56% I said, that figure is now down to 7 or 8% around the world. In other words, it used to be that one in two players was playing on after concussion. It's now down to one in 12, one in 13. Ideally, it must be one in 100, one in 1,000, and we want to work towards that. But the point is that there's progress if you drive education and you formalize a policy. Preventing concussion is another issue altogether, and that's something I'm sure we will revisit in the course of this year. But until then, let's leave rugby for now, and please do join me next time when I hope to crack, let's say, six minutes in the next sub-four-minute mile.